good morning, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. On behalf of the UN Human Rights Office, UNEP and UNDP, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all to this session on safeguarding civil space, business supporting human rights defenders to safeguard the environment. My name is Katia Kirizzi. I'm the deputy head of the UN Human Rights Regional Office for Southeast Asia, and I will have the pleasure to moderate this session today. We are fortunate to have with us today a great line of speakers, and I will introduce them as we go along. But before doing so, let me briefly introduce today's conversation in the broader regional picture. With repressive law spreading and increased restrictions on freedom of expression, participation, assembly, and association, among others. New technologies have helped civil society and human rights defenders to grow, but they've also allowed authorities to control their movements and their activities. Attacks on human rights defenders continue and they are worsening, and human rights defenders working on environmental protection are even more vulnerable. To attack. Today, we will primarily focus on the role businesses can play to promote civic space and stand up for human rights defenders in Asia. We will also look at the actions that businesses can take in respect of their own activities, as well as their role in advocating and establishing policies, practices, and ways to engage and contribute to a conducive environment to protect human rights defenders and enable their advocacy. Before moving to our first intervention, I would like to encourage all participants to place your questions using the chat box function, which you will find in the lower right side of the screen. We highly value and look forward to your contributions to this discussion today. It is now my big pleasure to introduce a video keynote address of the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders, Mary Lawlor. Her message will help us set the scene and frame the discussion we are having today. The Special Rapporteur has worked extensively with and on the situation of human rights defenders. In 2001, she founded Frontline Defenders, the International Foundation for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders, to concentrate on human rights defenders at risk. Currently, she's an adjunct professor of business and human rights in the Center for Social Innovation School of Business at the Trinity College in Dublin. So let's hear her message and the words she has prepared for us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be part of this event today. Some of you will know that my last report to the UN Human Rights Council was on the killings of human rights defenders all over the world. At least 300 human rights defenders were killed in 2020, many in Asia, and unless radical action is taken, these killings will continue. More than 1,323 defenders have been killed since 2015. In 64 countries, that's almost a third of all UN member states. I find that very shocking. My research also found that year after year, many of these killings are preceded by some sort of threat against the defender before a murder or attempted assassination is carried out. Defenders have told me that some threats are shouted in person, posted on social media, delivered in phone calls or text messages, or in written notes pushed under a door. Some are threatened by being included in public hit lists, receiving a message passed through an intermediary or having their houses graffitied. Others are sent pictures through the mail, showing that they and their families are under long-term surveillance, while others have been told the family members have been will be killed. Many are attacked with gender threats and targeted because of who they are as well as what they do. These signals in advance of attacks are increasingly made online. Human rights defenders in Asia have shown me many examples of threats made to them on social media. Social media companies have a responsibility to address this issue of their platforms being used to threaten defenders. 
They should take steps immediately to confront this challenge and they should establish and publicize easy to access public rapid response mechanisms to remove threatening content. They should close down accounts of those making the threats. And they should also publicly recognize the work of human rights defenders and condemn attacks against them and conduct substantial consultations with them. They must provide all necessary data to assist legal investigations into online threats and quickly and efficiently respond to threats uh, online which must be removed. They should also nominate points of contact for human rights defenders to easily access when they have requests to remove content. Of course, companies in the tech sector are not the only businesses with responsibilities to human rights defenders. Most defenders killed every year are those working on environmental land or indigenous people's rights, many in relation to big business projects. Businesses and international financial institutions operating in Asia should abide by the UN principles on business and human rights. They can do much more to protect defenders and they should publicly acknowledge that land and environmental defenders and those defending indigenous people's rights are at specific risk. They should develop and publish human rights defender specific policies in consultation with human rights defenders in order to better protect them and commit to mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. What business and international financial institutions can do is enormous. They should publicly praise the work done by human rights defenders even when the defenders are protesting against their project. When a human rights defender is threatened, they should take concrete action to protect that defender and publicly acknowledge the legitimacy and credibility of their peaceful work. Part of my work in this mandate is to engage with business as well as with states to better help them understand how they should respond to threats against defenders and with your help in providing examples and other information I will continue to do that. My next report will be on long-term detention of human rights defenders and will focus on those held in custody for over 10 years. I know like the issue of the killing of human rights defenders that this is a problem all too common in Asia and I look forward to working with you on it and all the other issues that you face every day. Thank you again for inviting me to be here. And I wish you all the best in your discussions and look forward to hearing about them. Our sincere thanks to the Special Rapporteur for sharing with us such a, a compelling overview, uh, analysis and, and figures, and together also with some very concrete recommendations on actions that companies can uh, including tech companies can undertake to safeguard civic space and protect human rights defenders. And thank you also for highlighting the specific challenges and threats and dimension surrounding the work and advocacy of environmental human rights defenders. The Special Rapporteur's words are a perfect segue into the introduction of our first speaker today, Anna Zvona who is the project manager of the Civic Freedom and Human Rights Defender Project and the Business and Human Rights uh, Resource Center. Since 2016, Anna has been uh, managing this project, which explores the role of uh, businesses in the spheres of uh, civic freedoms and, and human rights defenders, and is known for its uh, database on uh, human rights defenders working on business and human rights uh, related activities and attacks against them. She's one of the associates of the Just Labs initiative and has lectured as a guest lecturer on business and human rights at the global campus of human rights. Anna, if I could ask you to share with us, what are the trends you see in terms of uh, business and human rights 
uh, related abuses uh, against human rights defenders and also what are the main drivers of these attacks uh, against them and at the same time have you come across any good practices or initiatives which you think it would be useful sharing with all of us today over to you anna the, the floor is yours Anna, we cannot hear you. Maybe you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Um, so I was just saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for, for having me today. Um, I cannot see my presentation at the moment. Um, I can see it now. Thank you. Um, so let me just start by saying that before I dive into the question of attacks, I want to first highlight the, the important role that defenders play in business and human rights. Um, defenders in civil society already have such an important um, footprint in society and a crucial role that they play with business in particular in holding business to account in recognizing and, and monitoring business practices, creating spaces for participation um, at national, subnational, regional levels, elevating local voices, making sure that, um, that victims receive remedy, et cetera. So I just want to preface by saying that uh, before we dive into the attacks they face for, for, um, for doing this work. Uh, but as, as we all know, unfortunately, the sad reality is that um, attacks are, are on the rise and that is the, the, um, the situation that many defenders face for doing this important work. Uh, we have tracked through the database that was mentioned that during the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, we have seen an increase in attacks. Um, we have seen also the, at the same time, a rollback of environmental and labor protections um, across the world as governments seek to uh, address the economic fallout of the global pandemic through, through lowering um, entry requirements for, for investment. I'll now be trying to use the... Uh, Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm learning a new technology here by, by remotely controlling my presentation, so bear with me. Um, here I'm sharing with you some of the findings of the scope of the problem and the drivers of violence that we have published in our latest report in the Line of Fire, which looks at the 2019 data. So we have seen that the majority of attacks were concentrated in Latin America, as has been the case throughout our six years of tracking of, of these attacks, um, followed by Asia Pacific and then Eastern Europe. Many of the same countries have continued to be the most dangerous for defenders working on business and human rights over the past five years, and these include Philippines, Cambodia, Indonesia, and India. As in 2019, the most common type of attack that we have seen in 2020, which represents more than half of all cases, was related to judicial harassment. This includes arbitrary detentions and lawsuits allegedly based on trumped-up charges, in many cases um, definitely based on trumped-up charges, uh, which shows that this is a very prominent tactic in frightening and silencing defenders. In at least 73 cases, death threats, arbitrary detentions, beatings, and even killings were followed as clear retaliation after a person or their organization had complained to the authorities about a specific business project. I, want, I also want to highlight the increasing um, importance and, and danger of the so-called SLAPs, the strategic lawsuits against public participation, which we have started tracking uh, more systematically over the past two years. And in June, we'll publish our first ever analysis of these um, SLAPs lawsuits. And we have identified over 355 cases that have been filed since 2015. And even in this 
type of attack, also in relation to this type of attack, Asia is the second region most affected with 25% of all cases being related to happening in Asia. Finally, I want to say that we have also found an increase in discriminatory targeting of labor activists this year, including through dismissals and blacklisting. Um, which has been, for example, the most common type of reprisal and attack against garment workers. Um, and they face this for speaking out about violations of their rights and also as a tactic to stifle union organizing and collective action by workers. In terms of sectors most affected, as was already shared by the Special Rapporteur, we consistently find that agribusiness and mining are the sectors most associated with these kind of attacks. Uh, we have seen this consistently over the past six years and also in 2020. And we are also consistently seeing that defenders most targeted are members of local communities and in particular indigenous people that are at the forefront of human rights and environmental defense. And again, similarly to what the Special Rapporteur had shared, most of these cases that we documented uh, were cases of prolonged violence and escalating campaigns of intimidation that include stigmatization, digital threats, defamation, threats, and other attempted bribes, beatings, judicial harassment, and in at least 71 cases, those escalated to killings. In at least 270 of the cases that we recorded, attacks were linked to peaceful protests demanding rights respecting business practices such as in the case of um, the pandemic, providing proper safety measures to protect workers from contracting COVID, for example. Um, I just want to highlight one case, and this is one of very many, where a union leader in Cambodia, union leaders in Cambodia were singled out for their role in organizing protests to provide better protection in relation to COVID. COVID. Uh, for example, more than a 1,000 workers were fired in January 2020 in Cambodia for striking after a specific garment factory declined to pay seniority bonuses. And in February 2020, the f president of uh, one of the leading uh, apparel workers coalitions was beaten and injured outside the factory by three masked men on a motorbike. No one was arrested, no one was charged for this attack. And it was clear that this was an assault uh, as an act of retaliation for organizing. And this is just one of many, many such cases. Um, one other thing I wanted to highlight was that while we don't specifically track attacks related to the digital sphere, because we have tech companies on the line today, we did look into this aspect and have seen that um, in at least 41 cases, attacks uh, that we tracked were related to the digital sphere and that in many cases, those online attacks have then escalated into attacks in, in, um, in real life. And one other thing about trends is that based on available information that we have in at least 95 cases in 2020, sources point that, alleged, that there were alleged direct links between companies and the incidents. For example, as we said, filing strategic lawsuits against public participation, instructing private security guards to use violence against protesters or tolerating such violence directly threatening workers because of their organizing activity, engaging in direct stigmatization of defenders in the media, etc. But I do want to say that in most cases, defenders that were critical of company operations were targeted by other actors, not directly by companies. So in, in such cases, attacks were perpetrators, perpetrated by state agents, um, and then denounced by civil society, the UN, and, and other institutions. That, however, doesn't mean that in such cases, companies should not be acting. In fact, they should be using their leverage proactively to promote respect for defenders and, and to make sure that these kind of attacks uh, don't happen in their supply chains. So this brings me to the... Um, to my next slide, which is 
focused on expectations from civil society as well as from the political sphere and the UN and so as we have heard already as we have heard already defenders first and foremost need an operating space to to be able to do their work and so the best way for private sector to support defenders is to do no harm to not stand in the way of defenders through filing slaps against them through being involved in any other type of intimidation to silence them and in particular defenders should prioritize having having a clear structure around this so having policy commitments to zero tolerance of attacks and violence on defenders in their supply chains building transparent due diligence processes to know what's happening in their supply chains in relation to defenders what kind of risks they face and impacts that they have on them and also to review their um their suppliers in in, in the light of that. So, for example, if an MVST investee or a potential sourcing partner has a history of filing slaps against defenders, that shouldn't be a partner that they that they work with. And in all of this, of course, the most important thing is to continuously uh, communicate with defenders to build relationships with organizations on sub subnational and, and national levels to know what defenders really expect from them to get information from communities directly and to not just rely on on company self-reporting or self-reporting from from sourcing partners in relation to labor defenders brands can and should play an active role in negotiations between suppliers and workers in industrial disputes whenever that's called for of course by by the unions and and seek the reinstatement of unfairly dismissed union members and and leaders and really proactively ensuring that that takes place and finally as the special rapporteur said companies can and should also support the enabling environment through publicly recognizing the role and the work of defenders and supporting the expansion of rule of law in, in society. And this is, um, I'm, I'm hearing some background noise. I'm hoping you can also hear me. These recommendations, as I said, are coming from civil society, but also the political sphere. Um, and, and the UN. So I want to highlight that the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights in 2019 did stress that UN guiding principles on business and human rights already provide a clear framework to protect human rights defenders in the context of business. And they said that they clarify that when states fail in their duty, companies nevertheless have a responsibility to avoid causing and contributing to attacks and seek to prevent and address attacks against offenders linked to their own operations and business relationships. It's also important to highlight that we've especially recently heard very similar messages from uh, from politicians. So, for example, Heidi Hautala, the vice president of the European Parliament, recently said that companies should really uh, flip the way that they see defenders in civil society from adversaries to potential close allies for companies, and that uh, the dialogues with stakeholders should really be happening all the time, not just when acute issues happen, but really that there should be ongoing relationships um, of of really being able to, to, as I said, get information directly and learn directly uh, from, from defenders what's happening in their supply chains. We're seeing some of these um, recommendations echoed in the European Parliament's recommendation to the European Commission in relation to the upcoming mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence legislation. So we're really hoping that this role of defenders um, and the recognition of risks they face also is, is reflected in this upcoming legislation. And then finally, I want to say that investors, in particular financial institutions, have also recently been paying a lot more attention 
um, to to this to these issues, and they have also created specific guidance recently for their private sector clients. So, for I want to highlight in particular the IFC International Finance Corporation and IDB Invest guidance that came out in March 2021 um, on on this, and this is really also in response to the growing private sector interest in engaging with these issues. So we do, I do encourage all private sector uh, representatives on this call to really look closely at this guidance um, because it, it makes important and concrete recommendations in terms of how to respond to uh, and prevent retaliation. And then finally, I would like to say that that of course there are some some positive examples that are coming specifically from a cluster of progressive companies, investors, and business organizations that have really taken this issue seriously and and have taken the recommendations to heart and have adopted a zero tolerance approach to violence against offenders and are also increasingly understanding defenders critiques as important early warnings of abuse and risks in their operations and supply chains. We have so far tracked at least 31 policies by companies in several sectors, and there are surely more than that. And several have spoken out in favor of defenders and freedom of expression and association. They have taken actions such as using their leverage with governments, and, and having private and public conversations about the importance of civic space with them. Um, they have issued public letters. We have even seen examples of companies attending trials of defenders and, and really using, making sure that they use uh, their presence and their leverage to, to protect and to support individual defenders as well. They have, we have seen them distancing themselves from industry associations when those industry associations were stigmatizing civil society or lobbying against them, etc. And maybe just to end on a, on a positive note, I want to highlight the example of Microsoft, who is a long-standing member of, um, of a group of business that we co-convene with two other organizations, which is called the Business Network on Civic Freedoms and Defenders. Um, they have made, for example, commitments to, to really have no tolerance to attacks against, those, against defenders, including those that challenge or protest aspects of their own business. They have also committed to consulting with local human rights defenders as part of human rights due diligence and support their work with increased sensitivity to the challenges and complexities that they face, especially in countries where civic space is limited. They also said that they seek to build human rights defenders capacity to achieve their goals through increased trust in technology. And, and of course, this all then um, completely rests on, on how implementable and how implemented these policy commitments are. But we have seen some uh, positive concrete steps as well in the sense that they've um, released a service called Account Guard, which is a security service offered to customers in political space, and they in particular designed features of this to support human rights defenders. So we really hope to see more of such initiatives in the future and also more companies taking a really systematic approach to uh, preventing attacks on defenders and addressing them, not just through policy, but through process and, and practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for this contribution, which indeed echoes uh, a number of trends anticipated by the special rapporteur. But thank you for further unpacking them and for putting the spotlights on uh, specific uh, uh, case studies at the country level, and also for drawing our attention towards the uh, additional dimension of the impact of COVID pandemic and uh, uh, and. Uh, and on the other underlying challenges. But also what uh, stands out from your presentation is the availability already of a solid body of guidance, whether it's through the UN guiding principle, the EU or at the national level, and the striking gaps in their own implementation. 
uh, and equally so the lack of standard operating procedures to make the fulfillment of a free prior and informed consent um, a reality. But thanks also for ending on a positive note and sharing with us some uh, of the encouraging examples of initiatives undertaken by, by business. I will now turn to uh, our next speaker, uh, Mora Wilin Ampopita Yanan, who is the head of public policy, government, and philanthropy for Southeast Asia at uh, Twitter. Before joining Twitter, Lin was the country head for public affairs, uh, regulatory affairs, and social impact at Grab, and she also served as the head of public policy and government relations for Uber in Asia Pacific. Prior to that, she was a member of a, an international litigation and dispute resolution team and served as a law and policy advisor to the Prime Minister uh, of Thailand. Lin, welcome today. And my question to you is, how can social media companies positively contribute to building and protecting the civic space in Asia? And can you also share with us um, Twitter's policy and initiatives to promote civic space and protect human rights defenders? The floor is yours, Lynn. Thank you so much. And hello, fellow speaker, participants, organizer of the United States of uh, United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Thank you for this opportunity to represent Twitter. At this prestigious forum, it is such a great pleasure that I address the forum today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, some of you might be able to tell from my name. I hail from Thailand myself. It is such a privilege to be with you today to talk about a topic that is close to my heart. Um, as a public policy head for Twitter in, Southeast, in several markets in Southeast Asia, um, I would like to share, quickly share the basic um, for those who might not be update, up to date. We believe Twitter is the best place and a window to what is happening in the world. It is fast, often the first place to make the information available. And um, it is in the world right now, it is very public, making it a place where literally anyone can speak true to power and have their voice be heard, including the many 1,000 of environmental activists here in the region. It is conversational. Perhaps the most powerful thing about Twitter is that the audience is connected to each other. It drives discussion. Every two days, there are 1 billion tweets generated where the majority of our users are outside the United States. Twitter reached an average of 199 million monetizable daily active users. I would like to share with you about our mission. Twitter's mission as a company and a communication service is to serve the public conversation. Twitter is committed to fighting for an open internet to give everyone the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. Our business and revenue will always follow that mission in ways that improve and do not detract from a free and global conversation. Protecting the open internet is a key objective for Twitter, and it's why we exist. We know the commitment is filled with challenges. We know that civic space are shrinking globally, and I'm sure you follow the report from World Governance Freedom of Expert um, on the Internet. It is harder than ever to safely speak true to power, to investigate corruption, to be an environmental defender. And yet, activism grows. The importance and recognition of the critical value and urgent timelines for protecting our environment have never been more vivid or more publicly shared by so many, so many people. As um, Greta Thunberg uh, mentioned here, this is the biggest um, human, humanity crisis of our lifetime and we have to work together. We are in a difficult period for free expression, and that is why at Twitter, we double down our efforts. We are seeking to be as welcoming, inclusive, as safe as we can for those people seeking to advocate, communicate, investigate. This includes um, in environmental human rights defenders, environmental journalists, local communities leaders, we know environmental human rights defenders are among um, the most targeted harm everywhere, including online. 
we see that environmental defenders, um, they are working really hard and risking their life every day to protect the planet. As you can see the report from Frontline Defender here in 2020, 331 human rights defenders are killed around the world, where almost 70% are around 228. People were killed are environmental human rights defenders. That's why we at Twitter are working really hard as a core mission that we continue to see positive people movement, excellent research, including whistleblowers. We focus on providing service open, welcome, safe, as much as possible, especially for those who are in danger. And we know that climate change is the biggest story of our generation. We are proud to be the service to protect speech and the work of human rights defenders. Let me take a minute to share with you how we partner with the environmental NGOs and environmental human rights defenders in the region and globally. As a part of Twitter's philanthropic effort, we are dedicated to work closely with NGOs, IGOs, where we provide training, verification, free advertising credits, core ads for good in the five main pillars of Twitter for good. Environmental and climate change has been added to our key pillar of Twitter since um, 2019. Globally, we work with NGO partners such as Greenpeace, Earth Day Network, White for the Planet, Let Me Breed, WWF, uh, Friday for the Future, 350 Org. We are proud to work with the organizations such as um, Community, Community Resource Center Foundation, who is presenting as a co-panelist later today, as well as a law foundation in Thailand. Part of our double down efforts, we support our partners, work with them, respect them for adapting and fighting climate change in the front line. We also have been working closely with UN agency globally and regionally in APAC, for example, UN um, Environment program, um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNDP, UN Human Rights, who are all here today. Um, for our company commitment is to reducing our carbon footprint and our service to make a positive difference in the world. This April, we launched the first global impact report where environment and climate change is one of the main priorities. So we, we, we want to take a minute to share the importance of our continued work to make our service safer and make our service easier to use. As such a special forum here today, it is a privilege to acknowledge the work, courage, suffering of the work of human rights defenders, many of whom are working directly and serving communities where they live. Abuse and harassment, as well as hateful conduct have no place on our service and are against our rule. We have a zero tolerance against violent threat and those violate our rules, um, those accounts will be suspended um, immediately and permanently. Twitter is committed to be a safe space for women and all marginalized groups, especially environmental human rights defenders who play a key important role in promoting and protecting human rights. They are true champions working on the ground to protect people's right to safe, healthy, and sustainable environment. In the first six months of last year, almost 2 million accounts were suspended um, due to violating our rules, and half of these rules were for 1 million, 1 million accounts were uh, suspended for hateful conduct or abuse and harassment. On Twitter, we, uh, we want everyone to uh, feel safe expressing their unique point of view for them to be them, for you to be you, with every tweet. So it's our job to make um, your experience as safe as possible as you can, as we can. So, but we are recognized that um, if user experience like abuse and harassment on Twitter, that can jeopardize uh, freedom of expression, we don't want to let that happen. And for people to feel intimidated, harassed and silenced, that's why we have a dedicated tools. Uh, which is a set of tools to allow user to control the experience on Twitter. These are powerful tools for user to enjoy the experience, such as mute, report, and block. In addition, on the right hand here, in August last year, Twitter updated new conversation setting to allow people to choose who can reply to that tweet. Since then, we have seen more than 15 million tweets created 
with conversational controls, people told us to feel more comfortable tweeting and more protected from spam and abuse. Example, in the NGO in the Philippines, using um, conversation control during the virtual panel discussion, um, it was successful and they discussed internet safety. As you can see that um, it was during the Safer Internet Day um, this year in February. We also um, believe that privacy is a fundamental human right from protecting people's ability to use the service um, pseudonymously to offering meaningful privacy and security controls to overall our commitment to transparency. These fundamental um, principles are built within our DNA. People's rights to privacy and the protection of their data is something we have fought for um, since Twitter was founded in 2006. Here we also have a dedicated checklist for human rights defenders that I would like to encourage every human rights defender who are special and vulnerable group to learn more about their account security on Twitter from setting up two-factor authentication, changing their password, archiving their Twitter accounts data to incapacitated a user that will need a power of attorney authorized to act on the accounts holder behalf. So if you can connect with me later on, I'm very happy to share the checklist with you. And next is on that is health notification um, service timely support when and where it's needed the most. Twitter has launched over 268 that is help from with 44 languages available where um, we work on a wide range of issues from mental health, suicide prevention, vaccination, child sexual exploitation, COVID-19 related gender-based violence, disaster response to service our local partners' credible information. Recently, um, actually last week, we launched the first that is help from on freedom of expression, partnering with Thai Lawyer for Human Rights, I Law and Lawyer Council of Thailand to um, provide a service uh, for those in need of legal advice or representation related to freedom of expression. We look forward to partnering with more partners, civil society, government, UN agency to help people find credible information on the platform. On my last slide here, I would like to end it here that um, our work is never done. Bad actors are evolving their techniques to attack and to silence environmental and human rights defender wise um, publicly and online. And that's why we will continue to invest our technology product changes and to provide service to protect environmental human rights defenders as, as well as our user. Um, and tomorrow is the World Environmental Day. And you can see that um, there is a we have created a dedicated emoji. You might wonder why this is important, but we have seen the evidence and numbers that emoji campaign help create much more public awareness. And as a company, we have invested and promote the World Environmental Day. We um, look forward to partnering with NGO partner, UN agency, and government around the world in the region to encourage worldwide awareness and action to protect our environment. Thank you again. It's my honor to present it to you and please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, for uh, such a concrete contribution to this discussion and for sharing the, 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 the policies and the tools uh, that Twitter has uh, developed and created to address the specific challenges faced by human rights defenders, including the focus on environmental human rights defenders and uh, the linkages to, to climate change in a, in a regional context where uh, online and digital space is uh, uh, witnessing a, an increasing trend of all sorts of attacks and violence is uh, all the more compelling for uh, social media companies to take this type of initiative. So thank you very much for this contribution. Now, not only social media, but also uh, online knowledge platforms have played uh, a crucial role for sharing public resources to better understand human rights issues and to access that information in uh, various languages and in local contexts. This year, the Wikimedia Foundation is running a Wiki for Human Rights content writing campaign 
and is doing so in partnership with uh, OHCHR, the UN Environment Programme and UNICEF. And it's focusing on the uh, right to a healthy environment. We will now hear from Alex Simpson, Senior Strategist Community Programs at the Wikimedia Foundation through uh, a pre-recorded video. He focuses on how Wikimedia communities can uh, invite new contributors to Wikimedia to create a high quality knowledge that serves um, as a public need. He's also the head organizer of the Wiki for Human Rights campaign, which focuses on uh, documenting human rights topics on Wikimedia projects. He will tell us more about how does Wikimedia support civic engagement and what is the role of independent online platforms and reporting to safeguard and promote civic space, including in environmental matters. So let's uh, listen to his message. Hi. I'm Alex Stenson, a senior strategist at the Wikimedia Foundation. I focus on helping Wikimedia communities fill key no public knowledge gaps. And as an organization, we are focused on bringing the sum of all human knowledge to every person on the planet in their own language. You are probably familiar with Wikipedia, which is a free online encyclopedia in over 300 languages and viewed about 15 billion times a month. But we also support other forms of knowledge, such as data, a multilingual dictionary, a media repository, and primary source materials. At the Wikimedia Foundation, we know that free access to knowledge is a fundamental human right, that anyone it, anywhere should have the ability to learn more about the world around them. We believe that when people have good information, they can make better decisions. Free access to information creates economic opportunity and empowers people to build sustainable livelihoods. Knowledge, knowledge makes our societies more informed, more connected, and more equitable. This is especially true when it comes to environmental and human rights knowledge. With, without awareness and reliable documentation, we will miss the opportunities available to us right now in this moment to address uh, environmental problems. And we could see many global crises like climate change and biodiversity loss get worse. The Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement require not only just governments, but every level of society to understand, embrace, and transform, transform itself. Knowledge is the foundation to action of creating a more healthy human relationship to environmental stewardship. For the last two years, we have run content campaigns in partnership with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, focused on filling key knowledge gaps on Wikipedia. Last year for Wiki for Human Rights, our volunteer communities wrote, translated, and improved references to the reliable sources uh, on over uh, 700 articles in 15 languages about key universal topics like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This year's campaign focused on the right to a healthy environment. Over 1,200 Wikipedia articles have been created. Through this action, we connected the uh, right to a healthy environment, which is recognized in 150 countries, to local environmental issues and global policy actions. Our communities wrote content in all the UN languages, but also across less international languages that are vitally important for local communities, like Hausa or Tagalog or Igbo. Wikipedia works best when there is a reliable body of expert knowledge about a topic. Every statement on Wikipedia should be connected to a reliable source, a, a, a citation from experts, news sources, or other reliable publishers. We, we rely on this ecosystem of other knowledge makers, of publishers and newspapers and academics who create reliable knowledge. Our communities are beginning to organize editing actions around many dimensions of sustainability, and they need these sources to do it. One, I, uh, one area I find particularly compelling is sustainable fashion, the role of businesses, online communities, and reporters in publishing, sharing, and connecting best practices across a myriad of different organizations around the world is indisputable. The move towards global sustainability and accountability for the human rights impact of fashion is transparency of information. The transparency of information and knowledge at a global multilingual level is what's driving that change. And in the process, uh, creating this content on platforms like Wikipedia helps us fill knowledge gaps on the internet, um, on our platform, in every language about gender, sustainability, business. By documenting these things, we make them really valuable for the world. We also know that issues like the climate crisis require informed action. Wikipedia has 300 million page views a year on climate change related uh, content alone. 
every part of society will transform and we need public documentation of solutions for decision makers in every context, no matter what organization, geography or language they come from. You need both encyclopedic knowledge like the, that which we provide and the practical approaches that experts and other organizations can provide for every person to be involved in finding sustainability. And Wikipedia is that front, is the front page of the reliable internet, but we also need all kinds of other online knowledge stewards to connect their knowledge with us in order for us to achieve a sustainable future, one that's informed and connected to human rights and all of the addressing the global crises where we see today. Thank you for having me. And I really hope that this forum uh, continues to have great conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for, uh, for this important contribution which also speaks to the fact of the importance of channeling awareness raising about uh, rights, such as the right to a health environment in local contexts and through local languages. Uh, way too often, awareness raising is channeled to languages which are not of immediate fruition to the intended um, receivers, especially if we are looking at the grassroots level or marginalized communities. So this is really an important element because in order to defend your rights, you also need to be aware about your rights. And uh, now uh, this leads us to our um, next and uh, last but not least speaker. Um, so Ratamani Polka, who is the co-founder of the Community Resource Center. Uh, source career spans the past 20 years of public interest to lawyering in Thailand and she has been involved in many of its most significant recent cases. After working for years as an independent public interest lawyer, in 2010, she co-founded with her son Singh the Community Resource Center, which is a non-governmental organization working with communities who face the impact of uh, development projects. So, welcome. And today, the CRC has taken on about 100 cases from over 20 communities, including on the mining project, land rights, industrial pollution, uh, thermal power plants, and irrigation schemes, to, to name a few, defending the rights of hundreds of people in local communities. So I would really like to ask if you could uh, share with us your experience from the perspective of it's really in the front line of advocacy and also, what advice do you have for businesses to meaningfully engage with those who advocate for the protection of the environment? The floor is yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Katia. And thank you very much to invite me uh, presenting uh, about a human rights defender. I actually, as uh, Katia talked about, my background, I'm working with the community, support them for uh, the community rights, human rights and environmental protection in Thailand. And also we have some case for the transboundary case. That is why we like are working closely with the human rights defender who already want to protect their uh, right in their community and also <clears throat> protecting the environment and somehow for the public interest issue as well. And we found a lot of cases harass or against the human rights defender, <clears throat> especially we call all these kind of thing as a <clears throat> strategic litigation against public participation because of almost of the cases uh, against to the uh, human rights defender in the communities. It's not only with the villager, but it's also with the, uh, the NGO or with the civil society who are supporting the villager and also with the journalists sometimes. Then the cases that they are facing most of them, a lot of cases is about a defamation case. That is why we realize that defamation cases is about is about a, a slap lawsuit or a strategic litigation against public participation. But in the meaning of 
our understand the slab is not only defamation case because sometimes we have a lot of cases go to the court with our agenda to win the case by the by the corporate and some case have been charged not by the corporate itself but they support to the authority or to other people to bring the case against the human rights defender uh, we have been experiencing one community who are uh, fighting to protect themselves for the own, from the coal mining pollution. And these communities facing over 20 cases include the civil case and criminal case. And that all the case is not, not, did not brought by the company only but it brought by the administrative council member is brought by the police because of uh, blocking the road and then they got the charge for the traffic uh, acts something like that then this is all the cases we realize that it's not is the the agenda is not for bringing them to get uh, punishment according to the justice but they just put the bundle of the obstacle to the community to make the community fear that is the first purpose when the community fear to uh facing a lot of lawsuit they thought that community will step back and keep silent then if they success it will be like that then the uh the mining will we go uh freely but Luckily that the community did not uh, feel like that then and also because of the community have been support working from uh, by the NGO who are working with the uh, empowering and capacity with the community and also bringing us as the uh, legal aid organization to support them. Then we fight with this case for over 20 cases and almost all of the case have been dismissed of the because of some some case dismissed properly dismissed no any uh, chart but some case the community got some punishment but it's very small punishment like a, just paying the fine but this this come this case this result come out is not because of the just only the judge or prosecutor understand about the cases but because of <clears throat> the committee itself understand their right and they uh they know that what they have to do what they have to present in the court and they have enough uh, and courage to to present why they have to do something look like illegal activity and we as a lawyer also have to show that this activity what they do is not because they're willing to break out the law it's not they are they are not the uh, the crime but it's because of they have been harassed they have been violated by the uh, corporate who come to build a mining in their area and did not respond for uh, make the problem out. They cannot stop the pollution and they did not pay compensation to the community, something like that. This is just only one case it's happened. And we have another case that the human rights defender who just raised their voice on the Twitter or Facebook to show their support to another human rights defender. Like uh, this is the human rights, this case is about the company fighting the case against the women human rights defender who support the labor uh, victim from the, from the company chicken farm. And then after those three human rights, women human rights defender posted, on the 
Twitter or Facebook saying that we support or we are beside of the human rights defender. Just that it. And then company just fight a case against them because saying that, oh, under the post, there is the link. Go to the video, go to about two, three link to read the video that they said that video is uh, uh, defamed for the company. This is also happen whenever the company just think that they would like to, to stop all the uh the violation to them they said that they use they use their right to fight the case against the human rights defender but this is also another trend of the slap lawsuit as well to against the human rights defender to stop any kind of sharing or echo the voice of another human rights defender that we thailand now we have the new law we they call as an anti slap law but actually it's not the new law it's just only amendment of the uh, criminal criminal procedure court give the power to judge to to drop the cases before the trial if they found that some case bringing as a slap lawsuit but in the practice it is not it's not applied yet we try many times but our case also never get to use that law. That that is another thing. And other cases, uh, I would like to to say there is the journalist. He just making the report about uh, the the judgment from Myanmar because of this mining is in the way is a uh, uh, province of Myanmar, but the investor is a Thai invest investor and they this Thai investor just uh, extra bit the Myanmar company making the mining in that area. And this journalist just, just report the judgment, the judgment saying that company need to pay compensation to the villager because of the uh, company, mining company making the pollution to villager. And he made the report in Thai and released in the, their own uh, website. And finally, the person from that company, he is Thai, just complained to the police in Thailand, five case against him under the defamation case is a with the criminal case you can see that the cases is not only like inside the country is also outside and using the lawsuit against the the people who are raising the voice of another people as well we have many things happen and also lastly uh the the cases of the uh andy hall he is the human rights defender on the labor right. He, uh, long time ago, he was fired the case, defamation case against him, according to the report of the human rights situation. And then after that, he, he lost in the first court, but in the appeal court, and then he appealed to appeal court, and then he went in the appeal court, and he went in the Supreme Court. The court dismissed the case. But this is the civil case that need to pay a court fee. Then he have to put the, the 600,000 baht is about how much is 20, uh, 20,000 USD to the court because of just only defending that his case. But finally, when he won the case, he did not get back his money for the uh for the court fee because of the 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 judgment just say that um this case dismissed and no one need to pay each other that is also another thing we also realize that when we think about the bringing the human rights defender to court by the slap lawsuit by the judicial harassment the 
the actor those who are in the judicial process as a lawyer police public prosecutor and judge must understand about the situation of the cases what this is what is this case this case is about the slap lawsuit or not or this case is just only civil case or uh criminal case as a ordinary case then the judgment will be will be protected will be protect the human rights defender not just only making as a, like a dismiss or do something but never get remedy from the cases this is very very difficult for the human rights defender because whenever the human rights defender facing with the judicial harassment they have to pay they have to pay for the the time and they have to pay for the expenses they have to pay for the court fee it's many things they're not only just only winning the case that is can like a getting remedy but the remedy is protecting them and also keep them back for any cause that they lost that is why crc not only defending the case for human rights defender somehow we also doing how the case if we found any cases that is uh, uh have enough capacity and also have enough reason to do the how the case to make the company understand that not only you have money to fight the case against them commonly they don't have money but they have a supporter then the justice system also support them we want two cases that uh we we make a counter case asking that company bring the case against the community and then the judgment ruling that yes the first case that company brought is just like a fake case because of not agenda to win the case but just only bringing some bundle of the obstacle to the community and then uh court just granted the company to pay compensation to the community anyhow dealing with the uh, when when we deal with the company because company is just like a, not the person not a human being right company can can establish and then after that can solve can correct this is also happening here after the comp after the judgment making that okay you have to pay compensation to the villager then it's all the company just correct and then villager did not get any money they did not get any remedies this also another uh, gap of the law how to make the responsibility for the for the corporate link with the human being as a shareholder as a uh, stakeholder of the company then i think this is the this is a thing that we have to think how the government not to be the tool of the corporate to harass the human right but the government have to acting as a supporter and also protecting the human right defender thank you thank you much for for sharing with us really going to the core of a number of issues and challenges, including uh, what is the highly um, unbalanced power relationship between uh, individuals or communities uh, who are uh, targeted because of their um, activism and advocacy, and, uh, and then the complications that are linked to even attempted to act as justice on, on remedies, and including the not negligible element of uh, this becoming also an affordability issue because it translates into costs to be uh, to be covered, but also loss of income because of uh, having to be in court and not being able to um, to be uh, on on their on their work. So uh, it's really a very complex picture. And again, it, it brings us to the reflection that uh, online and offline space are just. Um, as uh, prone to targets and attacks of uh, of defenders, including at the at the grassroots level. So, thank you very much. Um,
sector. Uh, this brought us to the end of the of the round of, of interventions from our own panelists, and we will now have the opportunity to address some of the questions that have been uh, already addressed in the, in the chat box. Before um, posing the first question, I would also like to mention that two of our panelists joined us through a recorded video, but you're still uh, highly in, encouraged to pose any questions you would like to them to receive, whether it's uh, Alex or the Special Rapporteur, and we will make sure that those questions will be received by, by them. With that said, uh, let me uh, ask this first question, which is uh, uh, directed at all the panelists, uh, as follows. Much focus is given to responding to human rights abuses against human rights defenders. What active role can companies play in their prevention? And I know uh, some of you have briefly touched upon this element, but great if um, all the speakers could uh, could elaborate more on this um, with uh, three minutes uh, each, uh, if that sounds okay. And uh, shall we start from, uh, who would like to start? Maybe, Anna, shall we start from you? Yeah, I'm happy to start. And, and that's a really, I think that's a really good and important question because it's true that in our interventions, we had all focused on on attacks after they happen more so than on prevention but attacks they they don't come out of nowhere and they they really stem from this power imbalance as Sor had said and also and really importantly the lack of recognition of rights um of of communities and and of the um people that defenders uh support and 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 often represent. And I'm particularly speaking in terms of environmental land defenders, I'm particularly speaking of lack of recognition of indigenous people's rights, effort descendants' rights, the lack of recognition of self-determination and lands and territories, and, and the right to give or refuse consent to projects. And these are driven by, in turn, driven by several forces, historical marginalization of these groups, racism, and also the dominant capitalist model, which really creates these perverse incentives for both governments and business to want to weaken environmental protection and labor rights and pay lip service to stakeholder engagement and, and the the goal there is to really push ahead projects despite of lack of local support or um despite of lack of support from the wider nation with the goal of pursuing profit maximization with the goal of more aggressively entering um not just indigenous but but um forest territories around around the world uh to to be able to extract more natural resources and and i mean that's really the underlying conditions that that then lead to uh land conflicts environmental conflicts and ultimately to these attacks that we're trying to highlight through the database and through through everyone's um interventions these are ongoing processes and so to prevent these attacks i believe that the onus is mainly on states to recognize the interlinkage between attacks and this lack of recognition of collective rights including land rights um and to to really properly address this through through the land reforms that are needed through providing collective tenure through recognizing uh rights to to land through appropriate titling of indigenous lands etc and and on on the other hand also uh through putting in place uh legislation that would demand mandatory human rights due diligence from from companies and we are seeing movement in this direction and and i would say that the biggest thing companies can do is really to support such legislation to say that this is important uh in order not just to level the playing field which we often hear but also to to really protect to protect rights in relation to business and and um, luckily, 
we are seeing some companies really, really taking this message forward. Like we have seen over 50 companies recently in Germany calling for a stronger draft of mandatory human rights environmental due diligence legislation in that country. We're seeing European companies um, making similar statements in some cases in relation to European legislation. I think one other thing that's needed is for companies to really more publicly recognize also the role of defenders in meaningful due diligence, because if defenders and organizations are unable to, to voice concerns and to say what's really happening in supply chains, even if there are due diligence laws, it won't mean that the reality of what's happening will be actually visible. So, so that's something that I would like to see companies do more of, say, yes, we need mandatory human rights environmental due diligence and we need stakeholder consultation to be the central part of it and to be mandatory and and and, and to be uh, the champions of this message. Thanks, Anna, for touching upon extremely important points and also speaking to the distinct contributions that can come from states and also businesses. Um, over to you, Lynn, for your thoughts on this question. Thank you. Um, you know, like Twitter is committed to fighting open internet. Like we want everyone to have the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. But we know that commitment is um, full of challenges. And as a tech company, um, Twitter will continue to invest in our technology and to do product changes to provide service to protect um, human rights defenders or um, human rights defenders. Um, we also realize that our work is never done and we cannot do it alone. As mentioned before, that like um, bad actors are evolving, like the technique to attack and silent uh, human rights defenders. That's why at Twitter, we believe that partnership is a key to success. And that's why we are partnering with local NGOs, regional NGOs, international NGOs, for us to be able to understand and to work with them to learn from their expertise to be able to uh, fulfilling our commitment to open internet, freedom of expression, online safety, equality, environmental issues, climate change, as well as our crisis response that we are committed to. We also have a trust and safety council who are expert on the safety issues advising Twitter on recent trends and understanding the issues to for us to understand and be smart to do something proactively to be able to prevent and protect, including human rights defenders. Um, example of our proactive work, um, I have shared with you our dedicated checklist for human rights defenders. I think it's very important to also partner with NGOs to also share and encourage everyone to understand about their account securities on Twitter. And uh, we want them to understand um, whether the basic or the most advanced one to like really control their experience and um, that data security on Twitter, um, especially on um, two factor authentication um, or like it's basic from like changing the password or how can they downloading their Twitter data that um, it might be useful for them in like, for example, if they're seeking to ask for um, political asylum to be able to download that data to understand that is very important. So um, I will end it here and um, we are continue and we're committed to um, invest in our technology. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, I'll turn to you, Sar, for your thoughts on this question. Thank you. I think uh, I'm thinking about uh, the stakeholder of this issue. Is first is about uh, with the corporate who are the actor of the development project that is related with the human rights defender. What they can do. The human rights due diligence is the important role that they should have it to make sure that they understand about what the activity related with the human right or environmental issue. Uh, but sometimes it's not only human right due diligence mean not only review, not only know, but they have to do something to stop 
or to change the problem, to get the consultation, have to have they have to have open mind for public participation. And then when the pub when we talk about the public participation, it's also transparency for the company. Because we also know that if the com if the, the company is not in the uh, stock market, stock exchange market, then we will not get any information what they are doing, what they are uh, what their supply, and then we will not know that about the supply chain, what it linked. Maybe they are a very good company, support a lot of human rights defender activity, but their supply chain are uh, violated in another way. If they make it as a transparency and also working together with the human rights diligence, it will decrease the uh, human rights violation. It also can help to protect the human rights defender because they also can get the complaint and then investigate what is happening. But it should be in the proper way and also uh, have to understand that you have to give the big voice for the community and less voice for the company when they when you are in the middle person yelling the things. Otherwise, we never have a lot between uh, quality, uh, quality with the uh, community and company. That is the one I think that important role. But the other way, some corporate as like a Twitter, Twitter may not have any violation activity with with the human rights defender or with the people. And Twitter going to make about a lot of role to protect the human rights defender. But the other role is that Twitter also can be an echo of the voice of human rights defender. That that is that is mean like a if something happened with the human rights defender in any cases, Twitter also can help to make it echo, to make the civil society, to make the global notice about this issue. And when the cases become a big news, become the big voice, the protection will come to that case. And also the violator also have to think back to, to like a, or how we can do if we will be boycott from the others, other supply chain, or we will be punished or something like that. Then this is also another way of the corporate who are not, who don't have any kind of activity related with the like a human right violation or environmental violation, but corporate also have their own system to to support and protect the human rights defender, then it will make balance for for this uh, for this chair in in the business sector. And lastly, government have to make their very very good role not only making a law but no and no any enforcement. The problem of the protection system is. We have a lot of good law, but the good law never practiced or never enforced in any kind of like a punish to the uh, pollution factory or something like that. Then this is also another thing. Government not only protect the human rights defender for the physical protection, but they need to do any kind of punishment. They need to enforce the law in the very a proper way and recognize the human rights protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sor, and for also bringing our attention to the very important element of access to information and transparency all the way down the supply chain, which is extremely important. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, which is addressed to all the panelists. And if I could ask all of you to address it um, very briefly in, uh, in one minute. And uh, it's, it talks about women human rights defenders, human rights defenders living in remote areas, indigenous rights defenders experiencing specific challenges and what concrete steps can be undertaken by business to support them. 
If I could ask each of you maybe to share just one or very concrete uh, steps or measures that you think could be undertaken. And uh, shall we go in the reverse order now from uh, back to you, Sor, and then uh, to the other panelists? So back to you. Thank you. It's very challenging because of the COVID-19 as well. Then the online protection, online support is the very useful for the remote area, for the people who are living uh, uh, far from the capital. But we also have to recognize that they also maybe not access the internet. Then the, the stakeholder as an NGO, or the civil society should aware of this protection, should aware of this problem, and then uh, provide the support to them and not think that the human rights defender is the troublemaker. You have to think that the human rights defender is the supporting and promoting the human rights and environmental protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sor. Over to you, Lin. As we continue to face um, COVID-19 glo global pandemic, one truth has come up to bear over recent weeks and months is that we are experiencing no, no borders. And one of the element things that um, powering our share resolve at this uh, unprecedented uh, moment is that connected nature of the world connectivity that dri driven by the internet. Uh, to, at Twitter, we are continuing to commit to help raise awareness on this important issue. We are pleased to protect um, the open internet and fight against internet shutdown, such as what is going on in Myanmar. We support the campaign, which is called Keep It On, with the launch of a special emoji, Keep It On, which is um, um, coalition of more than 200 organizations ranging from research center to rights and local global um, advocacy groups, um, detection networks, media organizations located within 75 countries around the world to fight against um, the end of internet shutdown, to be able to make everyone to access to a global and open internet. Thank you. Thank you, Lin. And uh, now over to you, Anna. Thank you. <clears throat> Another important question, and I don't want to repeat what Sor was saying, but I really, really agree with the importance of, of transparency. And so I do want to make a point about that. Um, so we do often speak to indigenous defenders and what we hear is that this lack of information about company operations and lack of transparency from companies is one really disempowering factor that puts defenders at more risk and reproduces the power imbalance uh, between them and the companies and really puts this burden on the defenders to seek this information. Um, and so companies, especially in agribusiness sector, for example, which is one of the key drivers of attacks, being much more transparent about their ownership, about their supply chains and about their procedures that supposedly protect indigenous rights would be one key step. And I just want to note uh, this uh, research by Rainforest Action Network from this year that looked into this lack of transparency and found that none of the corporate groups they looked into have actually published standard operating procedures that would detail the mechanisms by which supposedly they protect free prior and informed consent rights, even though they've made commitments to this. So. Again, just juxtaposing this gulf between policy and practice and, and really encouraging companies to be a lot more transparent about um, their supply chains, their procedures, and to talk to civil society about them so that they can improve uh, together would be one thing to end on, I think. Thank you, Anna. And, you know, indeed, thank you so much to all our panelists joining us both live and uh, through recorded video. This has been such a, uh, a rich and, and thought-provoking um, uh, conversation. And uh, of course, one that needs to continue and we look forward to, to the next step. I think I, I would like to end maybe starting 
going back to where we started from today, which was the, the message of the special rapporteur and the very concrete recommendations she shared. But across a number of them, there was a key word that really stayed with me, which was any measure undertaken should be uh, examined or implemented in consultation with human rights defenders. Otherwise, it can result in being just a tick the box exercise. So for any step and measure to be meaningful, that element of engagement and consultation um, needs to be there. So I would like then to uh, finally close the session by again thanking our audience also for such an active participation through your several questions. We are sorry we could not address all of them. Again, huge thanks to uh, our panelists, uh, Anna, Lynn, Thor, uh, Alex, and the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders, and uh, uh, the UN Human Rights Office, uh, UNEP, and the UNDP. We look forward jointly to continuing this important discussion with you all. Bye, everyone, and have a good rest of the day.